Hey everyone, welcome to a new video, welcome to my channel, my name is Maika. Today we are going to be talking about my top 15 slash 16 favorite books. Uh, I say top 15, top 16 because I have two books that I'm going to group together as one thing because they're by the same author and that way I thought I could keep it sort of within 15 and make, keep it a manageable amount you could say. Um, this is just my list. If anybody asks me what my favorite books are, these are them if they're not in a series, I do have to say. So this is excluding series. These are all books that are standalones, novels, literary fiction, historical fiction, some fantasy as well. Um, I mean, it, it goes all over the place, but I do think it gives you a very good idea of what it is that I really like to read. Before I get into the video, I do have to apologize again for missing an upload, but I'm not sure if you can still hear it but I came down with a massive cold, almost turned into bronchitis, so I spent a good week and a half just not being able to do anything, and I really wanted to film this video last week and then use previous weekend to do a reading vlog for you because I was hoping to read something very exciting, but just even reading was, a, was something I was not capable of for a week and a half, so that's why I had to wait a little bit longer for this video to go live. However, I do want to try and make it up to you because over the holiday weekend, the Christmas weekend, I do hope to be able to film everything that's going on behind me. So hopefully by this time next week, I've got a bookshelf tour for you. Fingers crossed. I, I hope I have enough energy to go through this whole thing because there's over 600 books in here. So I hope you would like to stay tuned for that. But for now, let's get to, get to these wonderful, wonderful books that I love. Um, I'm not gonna go into any particular order. I'm just going to grab from the stacks as I go along. And hopefully with my descriptions of these stories, you can start seeing them because I tried grouping them together as in, oh, this is historical fiction and this is that. The problem is, <laughs> that a lot of these things start to overlap. And I think that that's a good idea. Like, I love seeing all of this here because it kind of shows me everything that I love. What's, so it's, it's a good thing. So I'm just going to start with what, lo, what's lying right in front of me. And that is this book. Oh, oh, by the way, a lot of the books I'm going to be featured here, nobody on booktube talks about ever. <laughs> so uh, I hope uh, I can uh, bring something new to the table here. Some of these books are also like truly, truly adored by many people, uh, but I definitely have a slightly different reading, pay, reading taste for most people on booktube. Um, Case in point, this one. This is a bit of an older book. I th believe this was going to be turned into a movie and then it never happened. But it's Marie Phillips's God's Behaving Badly. And this is a book that stands out in my list of favorites as a sore thumb at first glance. Because if you were to believe the marketing on this book and where I found this book when I bought it, it was in the chiclet section. As you will see, once we get to everything that's going on behind me, I don't really read romancy, chick litty kind of things. If something is, is, is branded like rom-com chick lit, I've tried those kind of books in the past and I always hate them, save for this one. So I think what, what I've been really, really like trying to get from a lot of the books that I've read past, like since this is this, but then, you know, I never really found it, so this is quite unique in a genre, you could say. But that's because I feel that the romance in this book doesn't take precedence over the actual plot of what's going on. So if you don't know what's, what this book is all about, in fact, actually one of my male friends read this and loved it too, but he's a historian, so I think he's a bit biased. Um, but the premise of this book is just super cool. What's happened is that we are following the Greek gods the Greek gods. They're living in London, present day, and they moved there in 1666 when real estate was just, you know, pretty cheap to come by because they had to rebuild an entire city. So if you wanted to build a house in London after it burned down, they were like, cool, we're a little short on cash, we need a place to stay. Mount Olympus is a little bit, you know, expensive in the upkeep ever since people no longer, you know, they kind of stopped believing in us. And that's sort of the issue that they're dealing with. So they're all cooped up in this house in North London, or wherever, in London somewhere. Um, they are cooped up all together in this house, all of these gods with all of these egos, and their magic is dwindling, their presence in the world is dwindling, because nobody believes in them anymore. And we are following Artemis, who in this story 
just to make make sure we can all make ends meet is a dog walker you know they all have you know human jobs you could say um and after a while she's just so fed up with how dirty the house gets that they put in an advert for a cleaner and in the end we get a romance between this new cleaning lady and a guy she knows from work or something like that and they get completely wrapped up into the all the drama that all these gods go through this is an incredibly sort of like mythology retelling like what would have happened to the greek gods if they were still around like if these were actual people you know um, we go to the underworld, there's a little bit of Orpheus Orf and Eurydice kind of reference in here. Um, Zeus is locked up in the attic because nobody knows what he will do when he is let out. Um, we have Ares constantly, you know, com uh, um, trying to come up with the next war on terrorism. We have Aphrodite who works as a telephone sex operator and Apollo who works as a TV psychic. It's lovely, it's got lots of humor. And it just has a really, really good precedence with all of these different characters, lots of big ego, egos, lots of drama, and then this human couple that gets sucked into it all. I really, really enjoyed this book. I've reread this like two or three times because it's just so funny. And I like if I have to go like romantic, sort of love story, chick litty kind of stuff, make it this. And then the books that I'm going to group together because they are by the same author. One of my favorite authors is no other than Neil Gaiman. And this is this is the fantasy rep uh, in, in, in this list, you could say. And I can't pick between these two. So that's why they had to go in Neverwhere and American Gods. I think I prefer Neverwhere over American Gods for the for, mainly for the reason that this story doesn't chug along like this one does. I felt when I was reading this one that the first two to three hundred pages were okay. They were, you know, readable, but it felt a bit boring at times. Whereas in the second half of the book, I really felt it picked up, but this is like 650 pages. So it takes a while to get going. So I think that a lot of people may just kind of like, like slack off in the middle of it going like, oh, where is this going? Um, it's got a road trip element to it, which I love. And of course, here again, and this is well, how it sort of ties in with the book that I already talked about, because this is also about mythology, gods in the current setting. Apparently it's a trope I like, okay? Um, I really, really enjoyed it. I love the TV series too, even though I love the book much more. Isn't season three coming out very soon or is it already out on Amazon Prime? May have to update my Amazon Prime subscription and get back on the bandwagon just so I can watch it. Because that's the only reason why I had Amazon Prime last year was to watch the first two seasons of this. I absolutely adore it. If you don't know what this book is about, what's his name again? Oh no, yeah, it's called, he's called Shadow. Shadow is our main character. He um, is released from pr prison early because his wife passed away. Uh, and he is in jail for, I don't know, some sort of robbery gone wrong kind of situation. And he then finds out that this wife was making out with his best friend who was going to give him a job in his gym um, when, he, uh, when he would come out of jail. But now they both were in a car crash um, while they were being together, he could say. And so they both passed away. So he's got nothing. And then after his wife's funeral, um, he meets, or actually on his way to the funeral, he meets with Mr. Wednesday, and Mr. Wednesday offers him a job. So his life is completely down the drain, and then this Mr. Wednesday gets him to sort of come in. If you are interested in mythology, how this story is woven together, it's humoristic, as most Neil Gaiman stories are, um, and it's also very sort of like road trippy, which I kind of enjoy as well. We We've got something else coming up like that. And it just has a couple of really, really cool features. It does mean that it does drag on at times, but I loved how this story went. I loved how it came together. The writing of it was stunning. I really had a good time with this. And this was the kind of book, and this happens to me quite often actually, where when I've just read it, I'm like, yeah, this, this, this was good. It was a four star read. But then like two weeks later, I was still thinking about this. And that's when I hiked it up to a five star for sure, because if books do that, if they make me think beyond what I've read on the page, 
I always really appreciate that, and this one definitely did that for me. I like Neil Gaiman for his inventiveness and his whimsical sort of writing, and I think it doesn't get more whimsical and inventive than this. Neverwhere, which I kind of feel is a little bit Alice in Wonderland inspired. I'm not sure if I'm wrong here, uh, but this is about a guy, I'm not sure what his name is, but he, um, his life is again not going very well, he lives in London, works in the city, his girlfriend breaks up with him, these two really strange characters show up, and then he finds out what happens when people fall through the cracks of society. That's why there's a rat at the front here, because the rats are sort of like orchestrating this sort of like sub-world, and there's this whole world going on below London, and it's sort of like when Alice falls down the rabbit hole kind of situation, and there's this whole thing going on, kind of like that. And this was very whimsical, very magical. This feels like a fairy tale for grown-ups. That's the only way I can I can sort of list it. So again, he's my fa one of my favorite authors for that reason. I absolutely adored this book, and I loved it. Plus, it's a lot shorter. So I think if you want to start Neil Gaiman, then start here. So I'm gonna try and keep the links going. So if we're talking magical, whimsical. The Night Circus by Aaron Morgenstern. This is, of course, a much beloved book on a lot of booktube channels. A lot of people love this. Um, but I read this far, like, long before I even knew what booktube was. And I completely fell in love with this story. I, it's magical realism, in case you don't know. It is about this, these two magicians who, in a, who are always sort of trying to outdo one another, and then they both have these children. I'm not sure if they're actually their children or if they're just progenies that they've selected to conduct this circus thing to, like, they've trained them up. Like, you know, we know what we can do, but perhaps we need to show each other how good we are by training someone up. And that's sort of where the story starts. A boy and a girl get put in this situation and then this circus starts traveling around. It's actually there in the story. And then people fall in love with the story. So we get multiple perspectives from the boy and the girl, as well as some of the circus performers, and also a boy who is very much enamored with the circus whenever it comes to town. And it's set in a very sort of like turn of this 20th century kind of setting, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And I just loved how this story came about, the writing was lovely, and I blind bought, it's right here, where you go, right here, <laughs> um, the, uh, the Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern, because I was like, if she can do this, then I'm pretty sure that that book is going to be great as well, even though I've heard very many mixed reviews about that new book, um, but that's definitely on their list to read for 2021, but this, which is really, really great, I know not everybody likes magical realism, but for me, and that's also what I feel with Neil Gaiman, like that's, it also has that magical realism kind of feel, but it's more fantasy than something like this. You know, this is just like real society, real historical society with a layer of magic, whereas in Neil Gaiman's stories, very often it becomes very magical straight away. Like there's always this like element, like there's a lake that's magical, or whatever, you know, it, and that's where the magic is. Whereas in this story, it never really is that sort of fixed in one place. And another story that has magical realism, but a little bit less than The Night Circus, but it's definitely also historical fiction, which is what The Night Circus is too. And that would be The Little Book by Selden Edwards. And this book, oh, it's been such a long time since I read it. Again, it's quite a big one, but it's worth every single page. This is a uh, story of a man who wakes up and he's like, where am I? This looks like turn of the century Vienna. <laughs> How did I end up here? And he's a modern day man. He has no money, no clothes. Um, and he goes to this, yeah, this, this pinnacle moment in history in Vienna where lots of things start to happen uh, just around World War I, I believe this takes place. And, or at least most of the story. Because we get time travel in this one. And it's a bit of a strange one, but it's so, so well done, the way this is written down. And then along the way, we meet all of these really important historical figures from, uh, oh, what's the name again of the guy who got murdered that started World War I? Why am I, like, 
Fr Franz, Franz Ferdinand, like the band, that's why they were named that. Thank you. Like the Kaiser who was shot and that set off World War I, he meets that guy. He meets Sigmund Freud. He meets philosophers. Like he meets all of these important people in this little cafe. And especially if you haven't been to Vienna, this book made me want to go to Vienna, so I, I went. Um, I have that very often with books, actually. I have another book that's not in this list, but that, that now makes me want to go to Istanbul. Sometimes if settings are just well written, you just want to go to that place. Or am I the only person who feels that way? Anywho, this makes nine, like early 20th century Vienna just come to life. Just really, really come to life. But then because of the time travel element, things don't always go as planned and things don't really, like he doesn't always understand how things work on the one hand and then like sometimes timelines kind of clash together it's a weird one it's strange but it's really really lovely and it is historical fiction with a magical realism kind of element and that brings me to my next category and that would be rock solid historical fiction the first one i would like to show you is this one and this is anthony Doerr's all the light we cannot see i read this a few christmases ago in one sitting in one sitting i set i remember sitting on the floor and i just couldn't put it down and for historical fiction that says something and it's like it's a 500 plus page book and i just kept going i just kept going this is beautifully written so so wonderful if you don't know what this one is about it's a dual perspective no novel from a girl in france and a boy in germany around the time of like the second world war um so they kind of go through this uh this space and we follow these two characters and you kind of know at a certain point like oh they'll, they'll probably meet at some point but they both live completely different lives the boy is very much interested in radios and putting pulling things apart he grows up in an orphanage and is very early on uh, recruited by the Hitler Jugend. So he's in the German army. And then this girl is very much protected by her dad because she's blind. And her dad has built this miniature version of the streets in Paris where she grows up so that she knows how to walk to and from his workplace, which is a local museum, and home. So she knows all the little nooks and crannies they need to flee because of the war, and then they, f they flee to this uh, little place, this coastal town uh, where her uncle or aunt, uncle and aunt live, I believe, and then her dad again does the same thing. Suddenly the dad disappears and she needs to make her own way in life, and these two characters are going through war, and they are trying to live their lives the best way possible with all the choices that come about, and I, this was just, so so wonderful it's not like romance it's like they meet and then they get off i believe that the moment in which they meet is only like a split second where they they it's like two storylines and they come together and then they go they're both each their own way again and i thought that was so so well done very unique very great way of telling the story really really well done such a lovely historical fiction novel if you're not into historical fiction normally but you would like to get into it then i think this is a good place to start but i also have for for the true true historical fiction lovers i have this one uh the street philosopher by matthew plempin again this is a book that nobody talks about anymore this came out i think more than a decade ago i picked this up Yes, I picked this up first and then I recommended it to my historical, like my history friend who I mentioned liking this book and he absolutely adored this too. Um, this is a book set in Manchester during the Crimean War um, and it's sort of like the spoils from that war get lost and everything that's going on and we meet a journalist who then tries to figure out this mystery and he meets a detective who's part of the police I believe or he's like, he's a I'm not sure if he's still working for the police or whether he's kicked out, anyways. But he's a true, true character. A character with a big C, as in big ego, loud-mouthed. He's the comic relief in the story as well. This is very well written. It's got a mystery at its core. 
but it also really sets the scene again in terms of like good settings i love a good setting can't you tell um, but this really makes the street of 19th century manchester come to life and that's why i really really enjoyed this however this is definitely <laughs> This is definitely like a true, true, hardcore historical fiction novel. So if that's not your cup of tea, then maybe maybe go with Selden Edwards because it still has that tra time travel kind of element or The Night Circus because it does have a bit of romance and that whimsical kind of thing. This is just cold hard facts, mystery, a little bit of detective work, um, but we just get a historical setting where things happen. So I don't really have a good link to talk about the next books, but if we just stick to the 19th century, um, then I, that will be the link because that's when these books were written. Uh, so we're, we're getting into some classics here too, because those also have to be on the list, of course. And again, this is one that a lot of booktubers like, myself included, uh, and that would be Jane Eyre uh, by Charlotte Bronte. I am, I used to be a very avid classics reader in the sense that I always wanted to read a classic and then something a bit more entertaining, read a classic. I kind of let go of that system because I very often found myself getting stuck in the classics and then there were other books I wanted to get to and then, uh, then it became a bit of a chore. But this is one of the classics that I've read that didn't feel like a typical classic where you're like, need to make an effort to read it. Um, so this, in terms of readability, if you want to get into classics, this is a very, very good one. And it's of course a very famous story. We meet Jane who uh, is sent to an orphanage by her not very kind aunt um, who had taken her in. And also at the orphanage, things aren't really going well because Jane is a bit of a character. Like she, for a woman of her time, she doesn't really fit in. She's not the demure girl that everybody wants her to be. And then uh, from the orphanage, she's like, she grows up, she's educated to become a governess. And then she's taken in to be the governess at Mr. Rochester's house. And then there's all these tensions and well, whatever. If you don't know the rest of the story, then I'm not going to give anything away. A lot of people like Mr. Rochester. It's a bit like in Wuthering Heights and in Pride and Prejudice, like Heathcliff and Mr. Darcy. These are like these big romantic heroes. I'm not here for the romance. I'm here because this is a dark, it's got a strong female character. It goes a little bit crazy at the end, I have to say. Like it gets a little like, I'm not sure why you're doing this kind of thing. However, I just think that it's lovely and dark. It's talking about some really important themes as well, but it's also still very readable. So I really enjoy this one too. And one of my all time favorite classics that is definitely one of those classics that is very much misconstrued in the general conceptualization of this story in modern times, but it's uh, Dracula by Bram Stoker. This is not what you think it is going into it. Let, let's just start there. If you've watched a movie called Dracula, this is nothing like it. This is one of the slowest paced books on the planet. Let's start there. It's letters. First of all, <laughs> these are letters written to, by Jonathan Harker to his fiance, wife, Mina, at first, uh, as he is trying to meet up with this count in, uh, in Romania somewhere who wants to buy real estate in London. And uh, it all gets a little bit weird and he can't really leave and then he finally escapes. And then of course, Dracula ends up in London at some point. Um, this book, I mean, <laughs> It, it's seen better days, this one. Like, I'm not sure how it got so waterlogged, but apparently it did. I, maybe I need to pick up a new copy sometime. But I've read this book like three or four times. It's the OG. Well, it's not. Many other vampire stories were written before this, but this was the first time that all of the tropes were roped together. And what Stoker did very cleverly course by now it doesn't really make any sense but a little bit like the the time travel and putting things that are mystical and magical in everyday situations that's what Stoker did because he took all of these tropes about vampires that have been around for centuries and rather than this being this like far away concept of something dark and scary that only happens abroad and in like crumbling down ruined castles he placed the monster in contemporary London. And that's what, what makes this book so important for novels in general, 
for fantasy and sci-fi and like horror genres in general because a lot of the tropes we see today come from this book. Is it as scary as you might think? No, because what was scary back then is very different from what we find scary nowadays. It's not fast paced. It's, it's got meandering passages where you're like, oh, where is this gonna go? But if you really want to read a good classic that I still love till this day, Dracula for sure. So Dracula for me definitely fits into not only classics, but it's also like a gothic story. And I love gothic novels. That's like my favorite thing to read. That's why there's two more on this list. Let's start with this one. This is Daphne du Maurier's Jamaica Inn. And this book I read back in 2019 and it instantly shot up to the rafters. Like this is one of my all time favorite books. I just knew the minute I put it down, this is one of my favorites. This book is about a girl called Mary, right? Yes, Mary, who her parents die. She needs to move in with her aunt and uncle. Wait, Jane Eyre, anyone? Uh, anyways, um, and um, her uncle runs the Jamaica Inn and she very quickly finds out that A, her uncle is not a very nice man and two, he's doing some not so kosher things and then everything is set on these like is it, it's set in Cornwall or Kent, like this really, really wonderful, but very rustic landscape. She gets lost all the time, can't find her way. Um, and then there's this mystery going on, like what's going on with her uncle? Daphne de Maurier definitely took inspiration from Gothic stories from the 19th century to write this. This was written in the thirties. Uh, she's the author of Rebecca which is a book I was trying to read this year and I kind of got started, but then I just kind of lost interest, not because I didn't like the book, because it wasn't the right book for me at the right time, but I definitely would like to w read Rebecca and then watch the movie for sure. And Jamaica Inn, which is such a great one. I love the writing of this. And if you like stories, again, if you like classics like War of the Ring Heights and Jane Eyre, it has a lot of those elements that those books have as well. And I think that that's why it ult I ultimately liked it so much but it's definitely a lot more gothic than those stories are. So the next book on the list would be Flann Flannery O'Connor's Wise Blood. And this is a weird one. I like weird books. I like weird characters. And it doesn't get any weirder than Hazel Motes in Wise Blood by Flannery O'Connor. This is not a book for everyone. I'm not gonna lie. Um, this book is sort of categorized as Southern Gothic horror. Uh, well, not horror, but Southern Gothic, you could say. It's set in the South, US South, in like the 40s, 50s, right after World War II. We follow Hazel Motes as he has just arrived home from the war. And whether the war has left some sort of trauma, I'm not sure about that anymore. But at some point in time, he starts to join this like religious cult and there's these like weird things going on. And I wanted to feature this one because I remember when I read this at the time, it was lovely, like when I first read it, and I read it like two or three times after it. And every time I read it, I find other things. And that's another way for me to say, okay, I really like this book, is if I can go back to it time and time again and it gives me something differently. And that's what this book does. It's weird. Hazel Motes is not a nice character. If you are someone who needs the warm, fluffy characters who you love to hug and it's not him. It's really not him. He's just crazy, you could say. Um, and whether it's really about his mental derangement, I'm not sure anymore because it's been a while since I last read it, but I remember reading this and just loving it. Maybe I should give this a reread in 2021 for sure, uh, because I keep recommending this and this is definitely not one that everyone is going to like. I'm very well aware but it is one of my favorites. Shall we stick to weird, unlikable character for a minute? A book that I know a lot of people are forced to read in secondary school and don't like is The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Selinger. I read this when I was a student. I picked it up for my library job where I worked at the time because this, was, this book was going to be thrown away because it has a loose page. Uh, and I was like, I would like to read that. That's short, I, I think I can manage. And I remember just really, really falling in love with Holden Coalfield. Not as a person, I mean, as, not as, but the way the character is written. 
And like Hazel Modes, and like this character, and the next book I'm going to show you, one trope I love in stories is an unreliable narrator. I love characters that I, I'm, I'm, that I'm supposed to hate. I love them. I like unlikable characters. It's just, I don't know what it is about me. I like it if they're dark and gloomy and liars and untrustworthy. And Holden Coldfield is all that. He is a very not so pleasant character. He's very egocentric. <laughs> um, and we just kind of follow him as he is sort of like fine. Like it's like his final year in school and he gets kicked out and he's doing all these things. And I think, and I know that a lot of people don't like this precisely because they don't like Holden Coalfield, and I'm like, you need to see past that because this book is trying to do so much more. Uh, it's not, it's not, it's, its aim is not to get you to like Holden Coalfield. It's to show you what happens if people can just get away with things. And that's why I appreciate this story. So maybe if you were forced to read this when you were a teenager and you're now a little bit older, maybe go back to it. I know that's very tough. Uh, but I'm currently forcing myself to do the same thing and read some of the things for like Dutch uh, classes that I was supposed to read then, which I never got around to um, because I just didn't enjoy it. But now that I'm an adult, I, I just look at things in a very different way and I can appreciate it a lot better. So that's why this one is also on here. I love this one. Speaking of unreliable narrators that get away with things, or do they? Money by Martin Amos. Um, this is sort of like the grown-up version of Catcher in the Rye. We follow John Self, who is quite possibly one of the most selfish men on the planet. He does, you know, drugs, drinks, women, everything that you shouldn't be doing, and he continuously gets away with it. He's rich, so he's like, you know what? Mm. Sort of like, you know, the whole Me Too, Harvey Weinstein kind of thing. Like, this guy, he could do anything. It's that kind of story. This is, again, a character you don't like because everything is written from his perspective. This book was written in the 80s, so time setting wise, you sort of get a lot of hints from uh, 80s yuppie culture. Um, and I really appreciate that book, this book for that as well. I thought this was brilliant. Again, a character that you're not gonna like, but I like those because I just like it if they're morally gray and they do things that I would personally never even think of doing. But then I get to relive it in a story, you could say, yeah. And then we're uh, in for the home stretch. I've got three more for you. And I think this again, again can go in line with the other books I just talked about. However, these characters aren't as morally gray, um, but they are still unlikable, I guess. But it's Jack Kerouac's On the Road. Um, this uh, was based off of real life adventures. It's a road trip kind of story. In fact, it features several road trips. It's not just one, but there's a few that are longer and a few that are shorter. Uh, taking place in like the late 40s, early 50s in the US. Uh, it features jazz, it features the South, it features the Mexican border, it features friendships and everything that's going on. If you don't know who Jack Kerouac is or was, he was part of the Beat generation, so Ellen Ginsberg, uh, himself, uh, William Burroughs, uh, and there was this whole group of people working together and producing either poetry, literature, all that kind of stuff. He was part of that, and they are the group of friends who are in this story. Um, so it's based off of real people and the things they actually did. Of course, it's always the question how much actually happened and how much of it is fiction but I really enjoyed this book when I read it. It's just a modern classic that I, again, adore. Lots of morally gray stuff going on in it. Again, I just, I love books like that. I can't help it. If you want something a little bit more wholesome, because I think everything here is like dark, fantasy, murder, ugh, bad characters. I think the most wholesome book that I've ever read that I truly, truly adored is Cullen McCann's Let the Great World Spin. And this is set in New York, and it's... <sighs> this is a very difficult one to describe because we follow lots of different characters, and Colin McCann, I'm not sure if he's Irish or uh, like Irish-American, 
Um, and he always has like an, a tie to Ireland in his story, stories because I also read this side of brightness and he has that in there too. Uh, but it's, it's never like center stage. It's like one character has an Irish connection and there's all these other characters. Um, and this book, uh, it's a bit like perhaps All the Light We Cannot See, where there's one moment where all these characters come together. And in this book, it's the moment that someone tight, uh, walked a tightrope. Uh, between the World Trade Center towers in like the 60s or the 70s, this actually happened. And he sort of took that moment of like, okay, what, which characters could bring this together? So we get all these different people who are living in New York and how they all know each other without really knowing each other, you could say. Um, and that's also why the book is called Let the Great World Spin. Again, we get to see like the underbelly of society as well as the upper classes. So there are darker themes in this story for sure. Um, but in the end, it was just very heartwarming. It's just really about how people try to make something of life. And I think that that's very central to this story and also his other book, This Side of Brightness. And I remember just coming away from this book with this really joyful feeling and a very strong emotional connection um, that I have to this book that I don't very often find myself having. Um, because very, I can just, I'm someone who can just read something and go like, yep, I read it, you know. I'm, just, I'm not that sort of invested in books, you could say, but this one had me very invested, not necessarily in the characters, but just their storylines and how it all came together. And that's why this one is another favorite. And I had to end it with the book that I always say is my all time favorite novel. I read it again in 2020 and I can say, it's affirmed for me that this book will save your life by A.M. Holmes is still my all time favorite book. And again, it's a weird one. <laughs> oh, I like weird books, okay? I like weird books, weird characters. In this book, we, re uh, we follow Richard Novak and Richard lives in a house in LA. He's divorced from his wife. He used to live in New York, moved to LA. He's a stockbroker. He kind of makes his money just by watching stocks going up and down, it seems. And he, he's got his life worked out. You know, he's got his his dietitian bringing him food, he's got his personal trainer, but he doesn't really have a lot of social connections. And then one day something happens to him, it seems like a heart attack, but he's not quite sure. So, but it's like, hmm, I'm, at, you know, I'm doing good, right? I was healthy. So he's taken to the hospital just for, as a safety precaution. And on his way back, he stops at a donut shop and he's hadn't had a donut in years. And this sort of event, and the man he meets, who's the owner of this donut shop, who's an immigrant, uh, is able to give him such a different perspective on life that it kind of snowballs his life into all of these different events that we then st start seeing. This book is a critique on society, how we live our lives in like, well, this wasn't that modern because this was written over a decade ago. Uh, so it doesn't feature things like social media or anything like that. I think it would have even been worse then, but sort of like the absurdity of Hollywood, of LA living, of like all of these strange things. Everything is like taken and like just blown out of proportion, you could say. So it's very funny. There's lots of like one-liners and funny things in here. Um, but it's essentially about a guy who's going through a midlife crisis and who's not very nice to people at times and that he sort of finds out that if he had been nicer to people, he wouldn't have been so isolated and alone. So it's very much a book that I don't know why it resonated with me so much when I read this because I was in my 20s. This guy's supposed to be in his 50s. Like I have no connection to this character whatsoever. But I just really, really liked it. And I believe the blurb on the back calls this a combination of Catch-22 and The Catcher in the Rye. I didn't like Catch-22. I do like Catcher in the Rye. <laughs> so it kind of takes the best parts of those two books and gives you this. So yeah, then of course it has to be a favorite. So there you have it. This was my top 15 slash 16 books that these are my all-time favorites and I thought we could sort of end the year on that note and give you that and then uh, yeah without, without further ado I would like to end the video here leave a comment down below with some of your favorite books I would love to know uh, maybe I've read them maybe I've never heard of them um, who knows 
But yeah, these were the books that I would pick if anyone were to ask me what my top 15 favorite books are. And uh, I hope you really enjoy your Christmas and your New Year's Eve. And then I hope to see you soon in a new video. Bye-bye.